Hey, what's up everyone? I'm the Burning Baron, but you can just call me the Baron. We've reached the end of 2021. Funny story, I barely knew this year existed. Perhaps it was because we were still in a semi-state of pandemic, but something about this year seemed less than notable. Despite that, I was still able to record YouTube videos with my friends, and there were still some great games that came out this year. So allow me to introduce a new, hopefully annual, video idea, Lasting Impressions. As the bland, obvious title suggests, this is a video that goes over my lasting impressions for the various games that came out this year that I personally bought and played. I'm calling this something of a self-collaboration with some of the things I've done on the Three Dorks channel. We do first impression videos there for games we buy on the day of release. First impressions are good, but what of our lasting impressions? It's hard to fully judge a game based on an hour of beginning gameplay. This video is intended to get my full thoughts on the games that I did first impressions on after having the full time to play and finish them. Here are a few things to note. First off, I'll only be covering the games I bought and featured on our Three Dorks channel. I'm leaving links in the description for the various videos of games I covered on that channel. I will admit not all the games I feature in this video were featured in, on the other channel, but I still plan to cover them here. The games my friends Ryan and Kate played for their first impressions won't be featured. Second, this is only the games I've played. I understand that there are a lot of games that released this year, some that were pretty big hits, but I tend to play what I'm interested in or games in a series I regularly follow. Third, I'm not leaving ports or remakes out. They are 2021 releases and they still have things to be said about them. That being said, let me list my lasting impressions on my highlights for the year. Starting at the beginning of the year, my first 2021 game was New Pokemon Snap. A long-awaited sequel to the N64 title Pokemon Snap, the art of photographing Pokemon returns in a huge way. It's already been more than two decades since the original game released. To see Pokemon Snap getting a sequel was already hype enough. On top of that, a solid seven generations of Pokemon had debuted since the original, giving the game a plethora of options to include. I was sincerely already excited by the concept alone, and really, that's all I needed. Getting into the game, it's not much different than its N64 prequel. You're put on a set path, and it's your job to take pictures of as many Pokemon as you can. The core gameplay and how it's controlled felt very familiar, which was great. You were graded on how well your photo turned out, which meant getting the Pokemon to face the camera, making sure it was centered in the photo, making sure the whole Pokemon was visible when possible, and a few extra details, like its environment, any additional activities it was doing, or if other Pokemon were in the photo as well. It was a similar, yet more detailed and arguably more balanced way than the prequel handled it. On the topic of comparing the two, one thing the N64 title did that was completely skip over few further grading if one before it was not satisfactory. If Oak thought, say, the first grading of the photo wasn't great, he wouldn't grade the rest of it. Here, everything gets a score, no matter what. That helps ensure that your photo still gets its fair critique, while also giving you a clear look at what you can do better in every area. I heavily prefer this to how the N64 title did. Going back to the Pokemon, I think the Pokemon present were great. I wasn't expecting every Pokemon to be present, there's no reason for that, but I was satisfied with, di with the diversity of what was chosen. It didn't feel like one generation of Pokemon ate up the entire roster, which is great for a series with eight generations of pocket monsters. The Pokemon themselves were full of charm, which offered many different types of photos that could be taken. One thing about this game was that each Pokemon had different star-rated photos that could be taken based on their behavior or activity. For example, getting a normal shot of Bidoof standing there would be a one-star photo, but getting one of eating a fluff fruit would be a two-star photo. It meant that you had to really explore and experiment with different interactions with each Pokemon, leading them to different areas, hitting them with fruits or light orbs, or taking pictures of them doing different things. I loved that, and it encouraged me to try different things each time. It made it exciting to see what kind of things would require for higher star rating photos, even if those methods were generally harder to figure out. And all the ways the po to interact with Pokemon brought out what felt like my own inner Pokemon professor. It was cool to see all the Pokemon interact with each other in new ways. It was charming, even more so than the original. But looks and feels aren't all there is to this game. There's how it plays, too. I stand by it being familiar and welcoming to play, 
but something very apparent about new Pokemon Snap is how challenging it can be. There is so much going on and your camera doesn't move very fast. Coupled with your own vehicle always moving, sometimes it's easy to miss something or, more frequently, it's hard to launch a Flufffruit or Lumia Orb at something. I guess it's never going to be easy to hit moving targets while moving yourself, but sometimes it feels like you gotta try and it's tough. The game didn't feel any easier to play going back to it, but it still did still feel just as rewarding to snap the perfect picture of a Pokemon. Especially a post-game legendary or mythical Pokemon. I'm not gonna lie, the footage I have of Celebi was not worked for. I have no idea how I got Celebi to appear, but for the sake of this video, how lucky is that? There are many legendary Pokemon that appear after the game, most of which have rather complex means of getting out into the open. Aside from Celebi, Mew and Lugia are the only other two I managed to get. Overall, I found new Pokemon Snap to be an amazing experience worthy of its predecessor. I don't feel the game at being hard to be a real problematic part of the game, since I feel that's how photographing wildlife is supposed to feel like. But for how familiar it feels compared to the original, how many Pokemon appear and how diverse the selection was, this game was amazing. Sadly, however, I just didn't find myself going back to it nearly as much. After finishing the game and exploring some of the post-game features, I didn't actually go back until I recorded the footage for this video. But I still stand by my final verdict. It's an amazing game. Next game on the list is the Nintendo Switch port for Miitopia. Okay, so it's far from a truly new game, seeing as this is essentially a direct port of a 3DS title. But considering Miitopia was one of the best impulse buys of 2017 for me, there was no way I was going to pass this one up. Miitopia is a charming, goofy RPG adventure starring Nintendo's own comedic avatars. I summarize the game in the same way as the Miis themselves. Charming, goofy, incredibly hard to take seriously. But the adventure is all the same. Some dark lord is going around stealing the faces off of people to spread misery and fear. Best part is, you get to cast the entire game. Yep, whatever dumbass idea you can think of, you can put into the game. It may, can make for hilarious runs when you see Big Chungus delivering you letters or Crunk taking awful photos of your misfortunes. But for me, this felt like a dream opportunity to see my own personal creations come to life in a new way. I've always seen Utopia as a way to bring my own characters to life and put them through the adventure. And that's, what, that's part of what made this game so great. Okay, yeah, being a port means that a lot of what there is to say about this game has already been said, and that this isn't a new experience to me. But there are a few new features added to this port that are worth mentioning. First and foremost, the horse. Miitopia on the Switch brings an equine sidekick to the team. Initially, I was rather indifferent toward the inclusion, but once I actually got the horse, I was cracking big smiles on how fitting it was. The horse felt so right, being a great companion for battling and a rather goofy comic source for the game's random events. And while my horse isn't particularly anything special to look at, the game's customizable options can lead to really hilarious appearances for your monster mauling mammal. Just ask Patricia how of the Three Dorks Play playthrough how that worked out. Speaking of customizable options, I think the one of the strongest additions to this game was the expanded options for customizing your Miis. Beyond the Switch's Me Maker already having more color options for your hair and eyes, Miitopia on the Switch offers the ability to put on wigs for your Miis for even more dynamic hair options, as well as makeup options. And I'm sure that people ran with this idea so far, even Nintendo wasn't aware of what they had created. The things creative people have made using these makeup options are staggering. It goes beyond just touching a media. People have straight up created works of art. Full faces that look almost identical to characters they're based on, ranging from characters, literal works of art, to dead-ass memes that popped out of the grave just for this game. It's baffling, but it's also amazing, on par with looking at actual art. That being said, something the Switch port doesn't have is the whole online searching of me characters. Rather than simply searching for things, you gotta get special codes that lead you to the me rosters of other people. And while that can be useful, especially when people give out their codes for many me's that they've gotten from others, that also means you need codes which naturally are gotten from other people. Sure, you can search for popular memes from the 3DS system through in-game options, 
but for anything overly creative that the Switch offers, you gotta find those. Another small but rather useful addition to the game are the outing tickets. Kinda like the Jolly John tickets from the arcade, outing tickets are a means to build up relationships between your party in a more accessible and less random way. Outing tickets can be obtained in the same way game tickets can be obtained, randomly through treasure chests or from letters from people across Utopia. They can also be won from the arcade in place of Jolly John tickets. Outing tickets are really useful for upping the bond with your team, and the events that happen range from wholesome to kooky, in a way that the game is known for. Okay, so most of what I said it feels more like side changes than anything truly gameplay altering. What of that? Well, that's kind of where the fun halts. Metopia on the Switch is still a port, and nothing much was added to the core gameplay that makes any notable changes. The plot is the same, the me rolls are the same, the gameplay is... the same... yeah. While I understand that ports don't naturally change much, I was still kind of hoping for a bit of altered options for the gameplay. My biggest problem with Metopia was how limited you felt in your team of 10. You only ever had control over the your starting me. Everyone else was AI controlled. I'll admit the AI isn't stupid and is fairly easy to work with, but for the genre this game is stationed in, it feels less than interactive at times when all I can do is control one character. And even if your me is not in the team, you literally can't do anything outside of using sprinkles to assist your team. I would have loved to have full control over the entire party's actions over the course of the game. Aside from the big gripe, there isn't too much I have to complain about. The game was still charming, with the addition of the horse adding to that charm, and I still got the same sense of adventure when I put my own personal characters into the game. It's still a great experience, even if I was really hoping for a sequel over a port. Mario's history with the sports titles stretches really far at this point in time. Dating as far back in the NES and even the Virtual Boy, Mario's had his foot on the courts for some time. I've been playing Mario Golf since it debuted on the N64. At the time, I loved it, even if I was terrible at it. And years later, well, I'm still terrible at it, but for different reasons. The Mario Golf series has seen installments scattered across several different consoles, including the Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, 3DS, and my personal favorite, the GameCube. The year is 2021, and after so many years, Mario Golf has hit the home consoles once more. Been a while, a nice solid 18 years. Good thing Super Monkey Ball taught me patience. And I wish I could say that patience was worth it. Mario Golf Super Rush. It's not a bad game but I wouldn't stretch to say it's the best the series has to offer. Straight up, I got bored of this game really fast, and I didn't even do a first impression of this game either. I would like to choke that up to golf just not being a terribly interesting sport, but then I remembered how much time I put into the 3DS and especially the GameCube titles. Yeah, I feel Super Rush suffers from a similar problem that Mario Sports Superstar suffers from. A distinct lack of Super Mario-ness. The game itself isn't bad, but it feels so generic. I will say though, the music, sound effects, and voice clips really hit the classic Mario Golf feel. They were incredibly charming, even more so with the opening cutscene hitting all the right notes. But I feel it's the courses that suffer the most. Many of the courses have such bland themes that color palettes could almost pass for an NES game. Sure, a few Mario series characters are scattered around, but I just don't think that cuts it. While post-launch updates added a few more courses, even they didn't stand out, with New Donk City and All-Star Summit being the only remotely interesting courses. But the problem with that is that those two courses now clash with the rather uninteresting other courses. The updates weren't all that long-lived either, with them ending way sooner than Mario Tennis Aces did. We saw a total of 5 characters in courses, and while that's 5 more courses than Aces saw, that's a really no low number of characters compared to Aces. You know, let's pause from that and talk about the roster for a second. Sure, the content seemed a bit lackluster so far, but the character roster, mmm! I'm almost looking less at the quantity and more at the quality, cause damn! I've never seen the Mario cast look so amazing in sports games. Nearly everyone rocks a unique outfit that not only makes them look great, 
but suits their characters so well. On any normal day, I don't usually pay much attention to the Wario Bros outside of viewing them as comic relief. But here? We knew Waluigi was a smexy man, but holy jeez, man's is hot! And Wario as a chubby ass cowboy? You know, maybe I can understand the retail pricing. More notable shoutouts to Bowser and Bowser Jr. rocking actual clothes, Toad's caddy hat making me say yes more times than I should, and my girl Daisy for looking fresher than Inklings on Splatfest night. Hell, even Peach and Rosalina, two characters I really don't care in the slightest about, have me saying, dang, cute outfits. You didn't just hear me say that. On top of the usual cast list, Super Mario Golf Super Rush brings in Pauline, Charge and Chuck, and King bob -Bomb as new char newcomer characters. Pauline also rocking a really nice design, King bob -Bomb fueling that newfound popularity, and Charge and Chuck being something of a WTF archetype of character. You know, like the first time you saw Wii Fit Trainer making it into Smash. Furthering this, updates made Toadette fully playable and added Koopa Troopa, Shy Guy, Wiggler, and Ninji to the party. Admittedly, rather generic choices, but I have to give them props for making Ninji a playable character for the first time in anything. To add to each character, they all have special shots, which adds a lot of flair to their characters on the course. It makes up for their lackluster hole animations. Oh, and you can use your Miis too, a feature I'm always happy to see. Which brings me to the next part of this, the story mode. Yeah, to be fully honest, I still haven't finished the story mode, and it kind of runs back to the first part of this segment. It's kind of boring. While I do love the premise of using your me as the main character, the boring core gameplay made it hard to sit long enough to dedicate myself into finishing it. Not to mention just playing through the Rock Ridge Lake section blew my interest away faster than 15 miles per hour winds stealing my golf ball mid-flight. I just feel like that killed the game for me, for how frustratingly annoying that part was to finish. Overall, I feel Super Rush is a fine game for people interested in it, but I feel the game itself just isn't for me. I honestly didn't play enough of this game to really rank the gameplay. While the core golf is fine, I didn't play enough of the other modes to really have much to say on them, nor did I have enough people interested enough to play with me. And even if the main standard mode is fine, I find it easier to return to the GameCube title. That game felt so much more polished and more fun to play. Super Rush is fine, but I don't think it had what it took to hook me in for much longer than what I played. September of 2021 let loose that stench bomb reeking with a musty smell that never seems to get old for me. Despite likely smelling like four months of no showering mixed with moldy cheese and garlic galore, Wario comes off as way more entertaining in his own franchise than he does in most Mario games. WarioWare's capitalization on stupid, crude humor suits his character well, and does a good job at visually showing that I never really grow up. Fart jokes aren't funny anymore, says the guy who squeaks wind. No company run by that cheese bag was going to be clean. Better live, learn to live with it. WarioWare Get It Together was a kind of dirt-covered surprise bomb. I knew it was there, I knew there was a good chance it would explode, yet I still didn't pay much attention to it until launch. And that explosion still caught me off guard. WarioWare Get It Together was loads of fun. Anyone who knows how the garlic chomping chungus operates knows that WarioWare is filled with pint sized Mario Party games. Shave off all but 10 seconds off that timer and you got a micro game. The core concept of WarioWare is to enter a stage and complete a set number of micro games to reach a boss stage. Beat that and you beat the level. Progressively getting faster as you go forces you to think and act faster to complete the odd tasks given to you or throw you off when a curveball is thrown at your jaw. But what of the catch? WarioWare does enjoy making clever use of the console's new shiny gimmicks. Where is this one at? Well, WarioWare Get It Together makes less use of what the Switch is capable of in favor of trying a new in-universe idea, the characters. For the longest time, WarioWare's cast was there to host their own set of micro games. This time around, the gang is playing their own games. From Wario to Mona to Ninevolt to Young Cricket, the game has a large list of characters to use, all with their own abilities and means to complete micro games. This is where the game shines the brightest. 
It really feels like each micro game is new when you have a different character at the helm. Some characters dominate certain micro games, others fare poorly, and sometimes a character outright cheeses the entire point of the game, 5 volt. This is what made WarioWare get it together so much fun. The number of characters to use, mixing and matching with other micro games, it keeps you on your toes. This is especially true when you unlock the ability to use every character in an endless run. It's challenging, forcing you to pay attention to who you end up with and seeing how their abilities can conquer the game laid out before you. The game even has the option to customize the characters' color schemes by leveling them up with gifts known as prezzies and decking them out with new looks. Sure, it's a small thing, but I like it regardless. Beyond the main gimmick, WarioWare Get It Together is pretty much the same as most other WarioWare games. Base story mode, few bonuses for when you beat the game, and the rest really falls to enjoying endless modes and getting high scores. There are some online features and bonus party games, but being a solo player, I didn't play much of either of those. But for what I did play, I enjoyed it way more than I thought, even if I knew I would enjoy a WarioWare game. May have that garlicky stench following me around, but for the fun I had, I'll wear it with pride. Surprise gifts that you don't see coming can average out to be some of the best gifts you can ever receive. There's a reason some people prefer to remain spoiler free. Works in the same way in real life, especially during E3, personally. I have two E3 story to, stories to tell here. The first one being a massive thank you to the wonderful person who decided to revive Mo Super Monkey Ball's grand legacy. Oh boy, this one. Being someone who grew up with Super Monkey Ball 1 and 2 on the GameCube and got Super Monkey Ball Deluxe about 3 or 4 years ago, these games taught me something valuable. Patience. To get straight to the point, these games are hard and force a lot of patience to get good at. Makes me proud to know that I've got a handle on both. Ever since Banana Blitz on the Wii, I slipped away from the franchise and didn't pay much attention to it outside of seeing Ai appear in a few Sega racing games. Fast forward to the present and I was given an amazing surprise that even leaks didn't prepare me for. We got a full on remaster of the first two games in the series, returning to the roots in their gameplay yet bringing in a lot of modern additions from characters to visuals. While I saw leaks for the game, I dismissed it as a new game that simply borrowed ideas and visuals from the first two games. Boy, was I glad to be wrong. Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania is the first of two games I was blessed to see at E3. A remaster of two of my favorite GameCube games, and then some, sold immediately. Why must I wait to play this? What's that? Digital download and I can shave a few days off that waiting list? Hell yeah! Seeing this beloved duology of games revived for modern consoles was a blessing I didn't even think about. These games were loyal to their source, yet still feeling new at the same time. The background themes were near identical, yet polished to look great, despite some background textures looking like they stepped out of the N64 era. Distracting to a degree, but still buried underneath a such colorful, upfront visuals. Aside from looking good, the game is played well too. Took a bit of time to get used to, seeing as I was super used to the originals, but over time this game felt like it handled better than the originals did. Ask any diehard Monkey Ball fan, skinny platforms are rough to traverse. But these games make those roads more manageable to traverse, and I love it. While I'm still prone to panicking sometimes on said platforms, I find it's easier to regain my control, as Telltale the control stick doesn't immediately throw your monkey into a fit. On top of that, you can use the right stick of the controller to rotate the camera. Any 3D platforming players, best friend, and holy hell is it ever useful here. Another interesting quality of life change is the removal of the life system. You are now free to make as many mistakes as you want without the fear of a game over. It really removes a lot of pressure. These options make the game way more approachable, yet not making things overly easy. I can confirm I still struggle on a few levels. And on that note, the stages themselves. All masterfully recreated and loyal to their original appearances, few exceptions. Anything involving amusement vision was altered for understandable reasons, yet the changes don't alter too much. But one thing to note is the overall difficulty. Many of the original's harder stages were made slightly easier in one way or another. To some degree, it's really hard to notice some of the changes, yet once you're there, they feel easier. 
Notorious examples for me include the SMB1's Exam C, Trax, and Curvature, all of which are slightly easier thanks to somewhat wider platforms and the aforementioned better handling and control. Meanwhile, some previously easier stages felt slightly harder, such as SMB1's Invasion and SMB2's Launchers and Cross Floors. I liked that. It forced me to relearn some of these familiar stages to get a better idea on how to complete them. It's in addition to the classic stages, there are now multiple extra modes that increase the challenge or just offer more content. These include a Golden Banana Mode, Dark Banana Mode, Reverse Mode, Original Mode, and DX Mode. Golden Banana Mode has you traverse a stage, collecting every banana there is instead of heading to the gold. Dark Banana Mode is the opposite, forcing you to traverse a stage without getting hit by any of the bananas, which are often placed in the worst places imaginable to make it extra difficult. Reverse Mode has you start at the stage's goal and make your way back to the beginning. Original Mode is the unaltered, original versions of many nerf stages, bringing back the classic sense of rage and anger over some of the game's more original, notorious levels. And DX Mode is the brand new stage included in Super Monkey Ball Deluxe. All of these modes, on top of the classic SMB 1 and 2 stages, make the single player content so enjoyable and easy to replay at any time. Alright, I've said a lot of good things. Are my nostalgia glasses blinding me again? Well, I will say that the gameplay itself and the overall feel of the game are brilliant, so most of my negatives are mere nitpicks at best. The game's story mode was watered down to a mere comic book style cutscenes and replays it entirely from SMB2 alone. I never thought about it much in the original, but the game's story mode almost feels irrelevant due in part to the, all of the story mode stages barring the final world, already being in the game's basic challenge mode. You're basically playing the same stages with different world backgrounds. And while seeing stages in different backgrounds is a simplistic delight to me, it still offers very little in terms of unique content. Additionally, while clearly a remaster of 1 and 2 and less of Deluxe, I much preferred having an, a, a huge marathon option that Deluxe had. These games split the stages of 1 and 2 separately, meaning you can't play all the stages at once. So if you want to access the marathon modes of the game, you'll be exclusively playing the stages from each game separately. It would have been nice to have the ultimate option of playing every available stage like in Deluxe, but again, that's just a nitpick. Other nitpicks, you can't play the main game multiplayer like the original. I guess that's not a huge deal, especially since I've rarely ever played with other people. But for anybody looking for a little competition, it may be a bit of a downside for them. And with the removal of lives and the scoring system, bananas serve very little purpose outside of earning you points for spending in the in-game shop, which is immediately irrelevant once you've unlocked everything. Beyond the main game, there is also the party games for friendly competition. Not gonna lie, I spend very little time here, like the original. I did play mostly the monkey race mode, while occasionally dipping into the monkey target, monkey shot, and monkey fight. But otherwise, I didn't play much of the party games in the original either. The only one I played with anybody else was monkey billiards with my brother. But even that was infrequent. And finally, we have a few extra details. First, and personally my favorite, the soundtrack. The new soundtrack songs are a general mix, with some sounding amazing to some sounding underwhelming. A lot of the new tracks and remixes for the SMB1 stages sound amazing, and even top their originals. Standouts include the jungle and nightclub stages, while the desert and storm stages are just as good as their originals. But others, such as the sky and underwater stages, just aren't as good as their originals. As for the SMB2 side, I strongly prefer the original soundtrack, though the Inside a Whale stage's new theme is to die for. The only gripe I have here is that my personal favorite song in the entire franchise, the SMB1 Monkey Race theme, is strangely not included. Instead, opting to use the SMB2 race themes for all the SMB1 tracks. Otherwise, there's a shop where you can buy extra modes, characters, and customizable options for the monkey characters. While I did customize Ai, that's about the extent of it, and I rarely use the other characters for no particular reason. Overall, Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania is a real revival of a duology of amazing games from my childhood. I absolutely love this game a lot, 
and I can easily find myself going back to it whenever I crave some super monkey ball action. Yet, at the same time, there's still a reason to return to the original, for its more desirable party game, or just flat out nostalgia trip. Modern Pokemon has become a rather interesting thing to talk about. Ever since Let's Go, it's clear everyone has choice words for the decisions the devs made with the series. I've done my best to mellow out since the uproar that was the decision to not include every Pokemon in the games. Hopefully I can live up to that for a bit longer while I talk about the long-awaited Gen 4 remakes. Okay, long-awaited seems cliché. Pretty sure we all said that back when Oraz came out. Early 2021 saw the reveal of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, met with some mixed reception. Chibi-ass looks right after Sword and Shield's design path? I can't speak from experience, but I recall that not being met favorable with some people. Personally, I didn't care much about that. But to get into the games themselves, well, my brother described them perfectly. Their biggest strength? Their faithful remakes. Everything you know and love about the Sinnoh region is there, remade for a home console and brings along some beautiful visual and many modern changes that have become since mainstays in the Pokemon franchise. The biggest weakness? their faithful remakes. Everything you know and love about the Sinnoh is there. And that's really all there is. Nothing huge was added, and a lot of the quality of life changes brought with Sword and Shield and even beyond are strangely absent, such as the easy EV and IV training, and the more versatile BP grinding options. Heck, the game even rolls with the original Diamond and Pearl Pokedex instead of going with a much more expansive Platinum Pokedex. I do understand why half of the generations of Pokemon are absent, but I wouldn't have mind a few out of Gen 1 through 4 Pokemon sprinkled in here and there. Post-game, that is. I kind of choke these games up to being faithful remakes where they wanted to be faithful, which I feel is the reason why many things that could have fit right in didn't make it in. But if you're looking to relive the days of Gen 4 in a modern way, that's where the faithful remake aspect shines. Everything is as you remember, but boosted in visual presentation thanks to the solid console generation jump. And while not all quality of life changes return, a lot of the core gameplay modifications made since do, such as the fairy type, some of the changes to status conditions, and other small details like that. And as someone who played Pearl a lot when it came out, I can safely say everything feels familiar. Right down to the dialogue. It's sincerely impressive how accurate and faithful it all is. And while a lot of changes made felt like they were bringing some aspects down, that's not to say every change wasn't beneficial. I'd say one of the biggest and most important changes was the HM system, which is still not present in the favor of a Poketch app that calls upon wild Pokemon to handle HM moves. And I feel this is a perfected method, even better than how Gen 7 handled it. You have every HM at your disposal at all times, meaning you no longer feel cut off by small trees, <laughs> get it, cut off, or blocked off by boulders. You, are no, you no longer have to find the time to get a Pokemon with an HM move to get an item behind a tree or a rock. You can just do it the moment you see it, and I still love that. And I think that the new way of handling HM moves is one of the best changes that the series has ever made. Gym Leader rebattles are also a thing, handled a bit simpler than Platinum. Much like Pokemon Let's Go, you can simply rebattle Gym Leaders once a day with their teams being buffed up and make for perfect training areas. But if we wanted to get into the bigger topics, the Grand Underground is likely the biggest revamp of the game trading in the strict treasure hunting feel for a mixture of treasure hunting and exclusive Pokemon hunting. Pokemon habitats are now included in the underground, allowing you to search for Pokemon that would normally be only available post-game. They won't be common, and not every option is available, but a lot of Pokemon that appeared in Platinum can be found in the underground even before you beat the game, which adds a few more options for you to use in your team. I can't speak much for the revamped contests, as I've yet to even play one, but I can safely say I spent a lot of time in the underground, even before I beat the game. It's probably the game's best main story distraction. Hunt for treasure, hunt for Pokemon, make a secret base. Okay, the secret bases aren't nearly as fleshed out as in the originals, 
but they serve a more gameplay focused purpose now in affecting types of Pokemon that can appear in the habitats based on the statues you place. More statues of the same type attract more Pokemon of said type. Statues can be found in the digging walls much like most other treasures. So once again, I have to agree with my brother on the overall verdict. Being faithful remakes are these games' biggest strength and weakness. Being exactly as you remembered it, while still including some modern changes, makes these games great trips down memory lane, especially since they are much faster than the OG Diamond and Pearl. But if you were hoping for remakes more along the lines of Oraz, well, they might leave more to be desired, especially in the post-game. But as someone who really enjoyed Gen 4 and doesn't really dive into the post-game competitive battling, I can sell for what we got. There's a reason I skipped over the end of October. I like to save the best for last. And there is no doubt about it that Mario Party Superstars is the best game of the year for me. I spent the five months from reveal to release excited as ever to play this game. Mario Party Superstars is what I wished the Top 100 was, and it delivered on all fronts. Superstars is a real remastered collection of not just minigames, but also boards from the original games, and a further return to format that Super Mario Party started steering towards. Super Mario Party may have gotten the series back on the tracks, but Superstars started driving that train down the smooth line. Superstars is a real love letter to the franchise whole to the point where even some of the smaller details are nailed. I absolutely love how even the opening cutscene acknowledges this game is a blast from the past. Perhaps I'm too used to Paper Mario trying to disconnect itself from its history, but to see this game pay full homage to its history almost surprises me, and in the best way possible. I can fully say that I love the remake of Mario Party 1's main menu, as Mushroom Village is all there with a few minor changes to some major changes. Along with all the callbacks and references, the boards are pretty faithful in their overall designs, with a few tweaks here and there to some of the spaces and features. Island hopping on Tro Yoshi's Tropical Island, to pathfinding on Woody Woods, to the all-out robberies on Horrorland. The boards are just as much fun as they were in their originals. Though I will say some of the boards were not my first picks. I love all the boards present, but if I'm going to be honest, Yoshi's Tropical Island and Peach's Birthday Cake are among two of my least favorite boards from the first game, and I have at least two other preferences over Horrorland from Mario Party 2. Woody Woods and Spaceland are two, at least two of my second favorite boards from their respective games, so that's still a pass. Still disappointed that they didn't go with six boards to even everything out, but eh, that's what hoping for DLC is for. With the game's true return to the original formula, it worked out great for modern times. The items were a great mix of reviving classics to throwing a few modern items in, such as the standard mushroom now adding 5 to your roll, and custom dice blocks being everyone's best friend, while using the more modern versions of the double dice and triple dice sets over mushrooms. Then there's the minigames. I'll admit there are a few things to note here, but let's start with the positives. The lineup is solid. Opting to not exclude anything that was in the top 100 gave a lot of my favorites present in the 3DS collection another go, such as Storm Chasers, Coney Island, Trapeze Artist, and Bowser's Big Blast, while new additions add to my already hyped lineup, such as Castaways, Mario's Puzzle Party, Money Belt, all now known as X-Ray Payday, Hide and Sneak, Paint Misbehavin', and Sneak and Snore. The lineup of minigames is awesome, but it does sadly suffer from a very noticeable problem, the diversity. I think it's clear that Superstars was meant to be a love letter to the N64 titles, as Mario Parties 2 and 3 take up a vast majority of the minigames, with Mario Party 2 having 21 minigames total, and Mario Party 3 taking up more than a fourth of the entire roster. Between the two games, they take up nearly half the entire lineup of minigames, which kind of chokes out the other titles. That leads to my biggest problem with this game, the Wii and Wii U lineup. I recall mentioning this at least twice now. Not gonna lie, I think the only way I can be displeased with this is if Mario Party 8 gets ripped off again. 
I absolutely, I still absolutely hate that there are only two Mario Party 8 minigames in this game and they're both a 2v2 minigame. That's just so, that's a big letdown. It bears repeating again, Mario Party 8's representation. Two minigames and they're both 2v2 minigames. That still disappoints me and is the leading reason I hope this game gets DLC. On top of that, Mario Party 10 has three minigames and Mario Party 9 has four, one of which is classified as a sports minigame that doesn't appear in the main game. Even the GameCube titles got choked out a bit, with all but Mario Party 6 having below 10 minigames included. It's kind of disappointing. Even the top 100 was more even and diverse than this, considering the highest number of minigames for one title was about 10 less than in this game. Beyond the minigames themselves, there's also the traditional minigame mode, known here as Mount Minigames. You just want to relax with minigames? This is your place. From casually playing the 100 minigames, to challenging yourself to 2v2 battles, 1v3 battles, or just duking it out to collect the most coins, there are plenty of interesting modes in this game. Want to try for high scores or make the, sport, make the sports games more interesting? You can do that too. I rarely ever just chilled with the minigame modes in previous titles, but I found myself going back to this mode way more often compared to past titles, which is a nice surprise. On top of that, the option to play random minigames without having to select them manually each time returns from the top 100, making free-range minigame playing way more relaxing and approachable. Expressing one more disappointing nitpick, I really wish there was another minigame island-esque mode for single player. With the minigames present in this game, that would have been so much fun. But I guess there's a reason for that, and that reason is the final stop for this segment, the online feature. Straight up, I've been online once, and that was just for some minigames. I have yet to play an actual Mario Party online. But from what I've seen, and somewhat experienced, the online was smooth, and I didn't run into any hiccups in the experience. And for the online to be readily available out the gate, and to have nearly every mode online friendly, is great for those who love the thrill of online challenges. Me, personally, I'm content with just playing with CPUs. But I know I'll be using the online eventually. Sadly, every mode being online friendly did give me the feeling that any single player campaign mode wouldn't be included, which is a bummer for me. But at the end of the day, Mario Party Superstars was the pipe dream I didn't think would ever come true. Comparing this to the concept of Mario & Luigi Paper Jam, another amazing concept that was sadly squandered, I didn't think a compilation of 100 minigames would ever happen again after the top 100. But I still hope to see the same idea expanded on, and Superstars did exactly what I hoped. Revived boards, gameplay, and more minigames to enjoy, Superstars averages out to be more than just a favorite Switch game. It's become my fourth favorite Mario Party title overall, beating out all but the original N64 trilogy. If you're a big fan of Mario Party or just need a solid Mario-based party game, this is the new go-to experience. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Happy New Year's everyone and I'll see you in 2022.